then indeed uh, we move on to the last speaker of the session, that's uh, Asta Form, uh, and uh, she will talk about a calculus for teaching first order logic, and I'll have to make her co-host. Um. Somehow. Oh, there. Yes, you are co-host now. And you should be able to unmute yourself. Indeed. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I forgot to unmute. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, good. OK, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, so yeah, this, this is a concise sequence calculus for teaching first order logic. It's joint work with my supervisor, Jan Wilson, from DTU. And uh, so we taught a, a master's course on automated reasoning in this uh, spring 2020 semester, where we used uh, Isabel formalizations heavily, uh, including the ones presented here. So uh, the title is actually only the third part of this talk. First, we will go into some history in our background knowledge of our natural deduction assistant. I will give a technique for showing completeness for open formulas because I don't think uh, this is covered very often. And then we will get into this sequence calculus. Um, so Nadia is a web application that we have for proving formulas in first order logic using natural deduction. We've used it both in this master's course and in a bachelor course uh, that introduces uh, logic, logical systems. And so you can see a screenshot of part of it over here on the right. What you do is you, you input a formula using point and click, and then the system will give you, uh, it will give you this little red sun, which tells you applicable rules for proving this formula. So on the first line, you see the outermost quantifier, uh, outermost operator as an implication. And we've chosen to try to prove this with an implication introduction. So the conjunction moves into the list of assumptions and now we've asked to prove B. Then we can continue this proof like that. And uh, the system does a, a number of nice things for us. It only presents applicable rules. So, the student is not overwhelmed by a, a complete list of rules every time. It keeps track of assumptions. So this line four is automatically discharged when we input this formula. It checks side conditions of the rules if this is full first order logic. And it also supports undoing and redoing to any state. So you can undo something, uh, do a few things, undo those things and then redo to where you were uh, at the beginning. And it's available on this, this address. Now, so what sets uh, our system apart is uh, that it's backed by a formalization in, in Isabel, which is more than 6,000 lines and it's available on GitHub. So it's a standard deep embedding of the logic. We have the syntax as a data type, we have the semantics as a function on this data type. And then we have an inductive specification of the proof system. And even though the formal, you uh, know, the online application is not formally verified, uh, we can export proofs. And then you can check them in Isabel, uh, export it to ESA notation, and the formalized soundness proof will guarantee you the correctness. Uh, another feature of the online application is that you can see the abstract syntax. Uh, you can, this is, if you can click on click uh, the application, it will go into this view where you see this inductive predicate OK, which is the proof system. The first argument is the formula you're proving and the second argument is the list of assumptions. And so this will familiarize students with this data type uh, construction of, of formulas. Uh, so just to briefly introduce, uh, so the syntax and semantics, so it's first order logic without negation. We use the Bruyne indices for the variables. 
our identifiers are just strings. Um, and we have, uh, so we don't have negation, but otherwise we have the usual connectives and, and both uh, quantifiers. The semantics are as you expected, uh, expect them to be given an environment, a function denotation, and a predicate denotation. And you can see the quantifier cases, there's some shifting of, uh, of variables to do with the deploying indices. So the completeness, so the system is proved sound and complete. The completeness is based on a formalization by Stefan Berghofer uh, of, uh, of fittings work. And there, the model existent result, it, it applies only to closed formulas. Um, but but uh, then I ask, uh, so I did this work for my bachelor thesis, and I, and I thought, what about open formulas? They are valid syntactic objects in both the formalization and the web application. So can we be sure that a proof exists for an open formula? So here's an example. You can just, so if you put in zero uh, as a De Bruyne in this index, you don't have any quantifier, then you get an open formula. This is how it would look in the web application also. And so I want to spend uh, the second part of the talk just talking about a way to reuse this completeness result to cover for closed formulas to also cover open formulas. There are five steps uh, to success. Uh, so what is the the context here, the context is that we want to show strong completeness for open formulas using the existing result. So we assume that under the assumption set, uh, this uh, formula uh, P holds. And we want to show that there is uh, a derivation uh, of P from assumption set. So what do we do as a step one? Well, we take these uh, assumptions and uh, we build a chain of implications in the object, on the object level. So instead of having this meta learn notion of assumptions, we just build uh, a formula, which is a bunch of uh, implications chained after one another. And we call this question mark P. And it's easy to see that this formula is invalid. Uh, based on our assumption. Uh, then we close the formula with the universal quantifiers. If you just add a sufficient number of them, it will close the formula and this also preserves validity. And uh, now we have, uh, we have a closed formula. So now our uh, completeness result for sentences applies and we can get this derivation uh, of the universal closure of the formula built from implications and from the empty list of assumptions. So now we move to working within the proof system. So we want to do two things. We want to first eliminate the quantifiers again, and we want to turn the implications back into assumptions. So to eliminate the quantifiers, we specialize them with fresh constants. And then we substitute these constants with the original variables using an admissible rule. And so you may wonder why not just specialize directly with the original variables? Well, uh, we're using the point indices. Uh, I'll get into this more in the next slide, but specialization shifts the point indices when we substitute under a binder. And uh, this complicates the reasoning we have to do, but uh, doing it in two steps, it sidesteps this complication. So again, so what happens when you specialize? I mean, you, so you remove a quantifier, you insert some term instead of the, the quantified variable. Um, so, but then when you go, if we are inserting a variable, specializing with a variable, then you have to increment this variable when you go under binder, because now it's pointing, and it needs to point at the same thing, but now you went under binder, so you have to account for that. And moreover, specialization removes a quantifier. So you have to decrement every existing variable that pointed beyond uh, the removed binder. So let's, uh, let's look at this, uh, this chain of, uh, of substitutions. So let's say we have this term P with variables 0, 1, and 2. It had originally three quantifiers in front of it, and now we are specializing the first one with a variable two. 
So when the substitution goes under the first binder, we are now substituting three for one. Then we are substituting four for two. And so the resulting term after this first substitution is zero, one, four. Similarly, when we specialize the second quantifier with the variable one, the resulting term becomes zero, two, three. And only when we specialize away the very final uh, uh, introduce quantifier, do we get the variables that we actually want? And so I was, I tried to think about this and uh, it was, uh, it was too, too tricky uh, for me. So, so instead we specialize with constants, which is just we, this, uh, these are not incremented when you go under uh, the binder. So there's no tr trouble there. And then when you substitute the constants with the original variables, then the closure is already specialized away. So we start set this complication. So when we go back to step five, uh, we just need to turn the introduced implications back into these meta assumptions. And it's basically the deduction theorem. So what we do is we weaken the assumptions with the antecedent and then we eliminate the implication with modus ponens, and we just do this for, for each implication. And uh, step uh, away a second. So we did something unnecessary here. So we introduced the universal closure, got the proof, and then immediately specialized it away. But why don't we just substitute the fresh constants directly for the free variables and close the formula this way? So maybe we want to introduce the universal closure for teaching purposes, but we can save the specialization step if we, if we close the formula uh, by substituting open variables with fresh constants, uh, free variables with fresh constants, instead of, instead of adding quantifiers. And this is how we have done it for the SQL calculus. Um, but uh, it's still, even if it's four or five steps, it's, uh, it's a bunch of steps to do this. So we are curious to hear other solutions to cover open formulas that are not just uh, universally closed them and consider them the same. Then we reach the sequence calculus, third part of the talk. So what is it? It's a one-sided sequence calculus that we introduce after they have seen the uh, natural deduction. Uh, it's the same uh, syntax and helper functions as Nadea, and it's designed to just be as concise and simple uh, as possible while covering the full syntax and the full full logic. So we have uh, we have these basic sequence, which are if you have a formula at the very front and it occurs negated somewhere in the tail, then this is a, a sequence that you can derive. And then every uh, rule works on the first and the head of the list of the sequence. So for instance, uh, an implication is broken down into a negated antecedent and the consequent and so on. Uh, the rules follow Smullyan's uniform notation. So we have alpha rules, which are propositional and do not branch. We have beta rules, which are propositional but do branch. So now we have two subderivations we need to do. Uh, the gamma rules uh, apply to uh, to every instance, so we can we can build an existential for any witness. But the delta rules, they, I mean, if you're going to introduce a universal quantifier, then the uh, the instance you are abstracting over it better be it better be arbitrary. But the students they know these definitions from from the day already. And then we have uh, the structural rule extra, which says that. Uh, if you have a formula at the head of the list, and you can prove this sequence, but this formula is actually a member uh, of the tail, then you don't need it uh, at the head. Um, so we have no rules for negation because it's the same syntax as in Adia, so it's an abbreviation, and it's covered by the implication rules. Uh, and every regular rule, as I said, they work on the head of the list. This makes it easy to write down the rules. It also works well with the simplifier, as we will see. Uh, and then uh, the extra rule is a bit uh, tricky to work with, as you can imagine. 
So we encourage them to use this extra uh, rule, uh, you know, this ext rule instead, which is admissible, and just says that you can prove, you can prove set, and you can prove any extension, which uh, just means that it, it has uh, at least the same formulas, but they may be in a different order, they may be contracted or duplicated. Uh, so uh, in the course, we use this, uh, this template for writing down derivations where we use the from and with to bring the applied rules to the forefront. So you can, you can read the, the left uh, side and see exactly what rules apply for each step. And then uh, instead of going, so we want to break down the formula instead of guessing the axioms and, and building towards it. And so uh, we use uh, this uh, if thesis or thesis if uh, construct uh, to, to do that. And uh, the simplifier can handle every application we've encountered. This is a very nice fallout of our uh, specification. But sometimes when there are substitutions, uh, it needs a bit of help in the form of a where attribute. And so uh, we are trying to prove this uh, existential. We want to prove it from uh, this witness down here, but if we admit the where attribute, then uh, none of the tri zero provers will, will find our, find this proof. Um, and that is an unfortunate uh, complication, but, uh, but one that is fairly simple to work around. Uh, so the final thing, uh, gamma formulas, they apply to all instances, as I said, but our rules, they destroy them. Um, so the solution is to start a derivation by duplicating the formula. So let's say we're trying to prove this version of the drinker's paradox. What we will find when doing the proof is that we actually need um, we actually need to uh, uh, to apply a rule twice to this formula. So we start the derivation off by by simply duplicating it, or if we view it in the other way, we we end the derivation by contracting it. Uh, and this is, uh, so in some textbooks you see like uh, rules that you have to, to keep the formula around and this, this is how we, we deal with this. Uh, so there was an exam in the course, uh, 24 students did the take home exam. There were nine proofs in this system where they, they write, uh, we give them a formula like this and they write it in, uh, in Isabel. And uh, in general, the solutions were excellent. Some proofs were a little longer than necessary, but, uh, but most of them uh, did excellent work. And the final grades were also very good, 10 A's, 10 B's, uh, four C's, and then there were two, two F's. And you can see the course evaluation online if you want to. Uh, and that actually serves as my conclusion slide. Uh, so there's an abridged bibliography. You can see the full one in the paper. Uh, but these are the ones that uh, pertain particular to this, this presentation. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for your talk. And uh, the floor is open for questions. Dimitri seems to have a question. No, Dimitri is applauding. Am I supposed to do something? No, I don't think so. Okay, good. People <laughs> are supposed to just speak up when they have a question. So don't be shy. Well, In one of these training sessions, some experienced Zoom user pointed out that people are too shy asking on this medium. Mm. I, well, I have I'm a not. question, oh. comment. Oh. Uh, uh, you. You said that in the very early in your talk about your natural deduction assistant that it would only suggest rules that are actually legal to apply. Um, is that necessarily pedagogically the best thing to do? I, I mean, I, I would say that my, for, for, in the beginning for my students, it's not obvious at all when they look at natural deduction, which rule to apply. So even finding that, would be a challenge for them. And so it shouldn't necessarily be offered for free. 
Um, I, I mean, it's definitely a choice, uh, and I, I agree that there is uh, there's also an advantage in in not making this uh, this selection for them. Um, Have you maybe thought about? Um changing your tool so that you can fine-tune how much assistance you want to provide to your students? Uh, this, so this tool uh, predates me, uh, so I've mostly worked on the formalization. Um, but, but yeah, we, we, have, we, have, uh, we have thoughts in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question concerning the uh, Isabel component. Uh, I, I assume in the course, the students don't interact with Isabel at all and they don't really need to understand Isabel, but it's just uh, your front end that they interact with. Uh, for, for Nadia, yes. Uh, for Sikha, they, they work directly in Isabel. And, and in the course, they also work on a number of other formalizations directly in Isabel. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't understand this. The students do work with Isabel. Yes. So, for instance, uh, I mean, so all the derivations that they do in the sequence calculus, they do that in the in the J edit uh, Isabel uh, editor. Okay. And with the but so you only for Nadea you have a, a graphic front end. Yes. Exactly. Okay. And do you actually find that? Uh, this uh, helps the students understanding, understanding of logic, logic that they have to they work have with work these with different. Uh, yes, so I think uh, so. Yeah, so. Um, um, I'm getting echo. Maybe yes. I should have worn headphones. Uh, so a nice thing about Isabel is that it, it gives you a warning until uh, you get it. Exp exp uh, absolutely correct. So I think what we saw in the course was that students were actually spending a lot more time working with these proofs than they would have done if they just did them on paper, because they were they were like it was like there was a, a teaching assistant telling them, this is not uh, correct. You can't do this step. Uh, you've got this case, uh, whatever. And they they actually worked on it uh, until they got it right. Uh, so this may, means that the assignments were maybe a little bit harder to grade because everyone handed in mostly correct solutions. But I think it also meant that, uh, that students put in more work and, and, and really worked on it until they, they understood all the details. But isn't that the danger that they have to understand uh, a lot more than usually? They don't just have to understand the logic, but they also have to understand the system that realizes this logic, the Isabel system, which, to be honest, does have some uh, a steep learning curve. Yeah, def definitely, definitely. And I mean, uh, so we also we uh, also introduced Isabel as just an example of, of automated reasoning. So it was already something we wanted to do. And then we provide, I mean, we provide this template for writing these derivations uh, that seems to um, cut down on the number of things the students need to understand. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, oh, sure. So you said that you don't have negation in the syntax of the logic you have in Nadea. Uh, what is the reason for that? Uh, so uh, that's actually a good question. And maybe Jan can answer it. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know if he wants to do that. Uh, I yeah, I don't know. So Nadia also predates me, so. Uh... <laughs> I see. Um, another question. Uh, do you provide some example problems for the students in that web interface? Or have you actually thought about randomly generating formulas that are valid for which proofs exist just as exercises. Because in my experience, 
students are always keen on having a lot of uh, examples to work with. I think that would be a cool thing. So, so uh, in the online application, there are uh, 10 um, examples that you can load of, of increasing difficulties. Uh, and there are also 10 uh, formulas that uh, we suggest uh, you can work on and there are some hints available uh, of, of how to get started. But you haven't thought about randomly generating? No. no. So, okay, thanks. Concerning the usability of Isabel, so on this derivation slide, you have the cartouches for the inner syntax, and then we have the funny uh, single quotes there for string syntax inside H or L. Uh, so you're consistently using cartouches, I suppose. And would you say that we should do this by default and then reform the string syntax of H or L to have normal double quotes? <laughs> oh, so if you ask me personally, uh, I think yes. I think that would be nice. And, and you do this consistently yourself, that you always use cartouches. I, I right? always use cartouches. Uh, and the students also understood that, how to type it. And I mean, so uh, uh, there was a little bit of confusion of how to, how to enter them. Uh, there's also this, so the way I enter them is, is uh, the double quotation and then I press tab. Yes. But this doesn't work if the, at least on Linux, it doesn't work if the, uh, if there's an error window open, if there's a, li a little pop-up open, you have to get, I have to get rid of that first um, before the autocomplete works. Uh, and this also confused a few of the students, but, but I mean, it was like a, a five minute thing. People say, why, how do I enter these cartouches? I tell them and then it, it worked fine from there on. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. More questions? I can just add a comment. Uh, so about uh, building on negation as an aberration, I think that's pretty natural when you come from natural deduction and intuitionistic logic is also uh, around. So um, it's just nice to have a system where you have that for also sequence calculus, I think. I get the impression there aren't any further questions or remarks. So then I would like to thank all three speakers in this session.